that um, if you would like to not be recorded, please go ahead and shut your video off. My name is Malika Albrecht and I am the president of the North Carolina Poetry Society and we have such an awesome group today. 41 people here already. I am very excited. Um, I did want to take a moment to say if people have announcements that we can celebrate or uh, things going on that you want to let our community know about, please feel free to unmute and speak out. Anybody? No announcements? Okay, well then we're going to just plug along. So today we have a fabulous um, day plan for you. I do want to invite everybody to use the chat section. Oh, David just said Cacolac 2021 submissions are now open. So that's fabulous. That kind of stuff can go in the chat section so that we can make sure everybody knows about it. And if you do have events that you want to let the community know about, remember, reach out to Linda Myers for the emus and let her know. Oh, good. Janice Fuller's coming. Um, and let Linda know so you can get this out to our community via the emus. That includes also if you have new books that we can celebrate with you, we'd love to do so. Um, in the chat section, we're also letting people know, please feel free to use that because it's a great way to communicate. If you'd like to join us for lunch, I will pause the recording <laughs> so y'all can just hang out in community with each other <laughs> for lunch. And with that said, I'm going to mute myself, which is a fabulous thing. And I'm going to turn it over to Celestine Davis, our programming vice president. Welcome, Celestine. Oh, welcome. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see you all here. I really don't have that much to say. We have a full program today, mm -hmm. but I just want to welcome you. I'm going to read this little short poem by E.E. E. Cummings, which I love his work, even though despite his little controversial 1916 poem, I still love his work. And I like this particular one because it's just whimsy. You know, it makes me think of a newness and I'm hoping, you know, I got my shot the other day, so I'm, I'm ready for things to start afresh and new, you know? So I'm just gonna read this. It's called, Anyone Lived in a Pretty Howl Town. Anyone lived in a pretty howl town with up so floating many bells down, spring, summer, autumn, winter, he sang his didn't, he danced his did. Women and men, both little and small, care for anyone, not at all. They sow their isn't, they reap their same, sun, moon, stars, rain. Children guessed, but only a few, and up and down they forgot as up they grew. Autumn, winter, spring, summer, that no one loved him more by more. When by now and tree by leaf, she laughed his joy, she cried his grief. Bird by snow and stirred by still, anyone's any was all to her. Someone's married their everyone's, laughed their cryings and did their dance. Sleep, wake, hope, and then, they said their nevers, they slept their dream. Stars, rain, sun, moon, and only the snow can begin to explain how children are apt to forget to remember with ups of floating many bells down. One day anyone died, I guess, and no one stopped to kiss his face. Busy folk buried them side by side, little by little, and was by was. All by all, and deep by deep, and more by more, they dreamed their sleep. No one and anyone, earth by April, wish by spirit, and if by yes. Women and men, both dong and ding, summer, autumns, winter, spring, reap their sowing and went their cane, sun, moon, stars, and rain. I guess I like that because it's just everyday life and I'm ready to get back to everyday life, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> today uh, we're gonna have a beautiful readings by um, Poetry in Plain Sight Poets presented to us by uh, former uh, president of North Carolina Poetry Society, Sam Barbie. And um, I'm gonna turn that over to Sam now. So he's gonna uh, going to just introduce everyone and he's gonna run this portion of the show. And so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I look forward to seeing you later on in our next meeting. We're gonna have like Sam Reagan Day and a lot of contests, student contests. It's coming up in May and adult contests coming up in May. So just welcome and look forward to more announcements later on our website and also on Facebook. Sam, take it away. Good morning, everybody. As we, as we process through the, uh, the reading, uh, could you make sure that your uh, microphones are muted so uh, none of the poets will be disturbed? Thank you. Well, I have a few things I wanted to touch on before we began the actual readings about a little history of uh, poetry in plain sight for those of you who may not be familiar with it. In 2012, Rodney Holman, an African-American poet here in Winston-Salem, 
began an effort to hang poetry posters in the Winston-Salem Transit Authority. Rodney worked at Winston-Salem State, you know, our HBC here, and he reached out to collaborate with the Winston-Salem writers. Carol Roan, the Winston-Salem writers uh, president then, and I met with him and instantly we wanted to be involved. And so we three met with Kevin Watson of Press 53, who many of you know, and we couldn't have had a better partner with Kevin and Poetry in Plain Sight was born. Since then, poems from almost 300 North Carolina poets have been featured in the program and many more, many of them more than once, which is nice because it gives Pips a sense of legacy that uh, we enjoy. Last January, D Donna Wallace, a longtime friend of the program and uh, also a participant in the program, served as Winston-Salem uh, coordinator. We met with Bart Gansert. You muted, Sam. <laughs> Yeah, he's back. Shall I start over? Who muted me? <laughs> How far did I get before the muted? You got to Donna Wallace. Okay, I'll start there. Last January, Donna Wallace, a longtime friend of the program, um, and I met with Bart Ganser, the current Winston-Salem Writers President, and we were able to transition Pips from Winston-Salem to the North Carolina Poetry Society, and now uh, who is now the sole owner of the trademark and all of the other uh, things that go along with poetry in plain sight. And it made sense because as a past president, I recognize the Poetry Society has the leadership, they have the organization and infrastructure to manage a program like PIPS on a statewide level. PIPS has grown from just a Winston-Salem uh, enterprise to Newburn, headed up by Sam Love in Burnsville Everybody's friend, Pat Seal, is the uh, coordinator there. Uh, we've had discussions about host cities at you know, Wilmington, Mount Airy, Sanford, Oxford, and Ashborough. And I hope some of those work out. We've stayed away from the, you know, the larger cities because they have such a, such a presence of art and poetry already. We just don't want to get lost you know, in all of their successes. This 2000, uh, 2020 competition involved almost 100 North Carolina poets and 300 poems, which is a real wow. That's the biggest we've ever had, biggest participation ever. And our judges were Gabrielle Freeman, Beth Copeland, and Leonard Moore. I want to give a shout out to some of our enduring sponsors. Winston-Salem Writers gave us a tremendous seed fund when we, tr when we took ownership of the program, which will pay for their posters for several years. And um, also, co of course, Kevin at Press 53 and Ed Southern and his board and staff have always been supportive of uh, PIPS. And those three, for their, since the program's inception, have really walked the walk with us. They've been there as a uh, right all, every step of the way. And Kevin will begin layouts of your poems probably in eight, uh, next week for April and May. And hopefully we can mail them out to Newburn and Burnsville for Poetry Month. So to kick it off, I'm going to read Rodney's poem. Uh, Rodney lost his life to cancer, but he was a good poet. And sadly, he died a month before the posters were to start being hung in Winston. So I'm gonna get through this. <laughs> this, is, this is his poster, Venus. Venus, I have tracked your path across the sky, holding you in my mind's eye even after your disappearance, but glad on the eve of your rebirth across my horizon to savor the approaching shadow, the steps, the breaths, the rustlings at my threshold. And at your last call, I am always in plain sight for you. Hence the poetry in plain sight. Okay, um, I have a little, Chris Abadi 
Chris Abadi, um, Kathy Ackerman, and Jenny Bates will start us off. Um, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to go through the uh, list of poets and we're going to do it alphabetically. And uh, that no doubt will change as people come in and out in the next next hour. And uh, just depends on who can, you know, who comes in on the Zoom. Uh, but so please tell us who you are, where you live and the title of your poem. If there's any credits that you want to mention that where the poem may have been recognized before, that's fine. And, uh, but try to keep it just to reading the poem because we are on the clock here and we want to get, uh, get through everyone. Uh, so Mr. Chris, go ahead. All right, thank you, Sam. Hey, everybody. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Chris Abate. I live in Holly Springs, which is close to Raleigh. And um, my poem is, uh, this poem will be in a book that's gonna be published by Future Cycle Press next March. So I have a year that, I'll be, uh, that this thing will be simmering and waiting to be put into a book. Uh, and it's called, Where Eternity Be Begins. No, she said. I was pointing at the fingertips of the long leaf pines swaying in heaven above us. She genuflected and held her palm over the face of a dandelion here. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Ackerman. Good morning. I'm um, coming to you from Polk County in the western part of the state. And uh, my poem is about, uh, well, it combines a heinous murder of a hen in the middle of the night with this whole notion of COVID um, being spread through the air, which of course we have to have. This is the sound of a hen in talons while I shelter in place. The sound of a hen in talons while I shelter in place is the sound of all our losses honed into a single cry. So loud the train nearby is background hum. Morning brings confetti feathers near the maple where she must have roosted, sure she was invisible. To wake to any death is an awakening, my quickened breath anxious as hers, soaring higher than she had ever been. <clears throat> I peer into the shattered day as if being human, I can change this. Feel the weight, nothing but air. Thanks. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, Jenny Bates. Jenny, you're muted if you, Jenny was, Jenny's a, lives out in the woods and sometimes she has trouble. I think this may be one of those times. We can come back to her. Um, let's uh, see. The, oh, here she is. Go ahead, Jenny. Is it me? You got me? I gotcha. <laughs> you can see me? No. We oh. just, but we can hear you. You can hear me. Okay, that's good enough. <laughs> uh, the poem I'm going to read uh, will be in a new collection coming out in 2022. Um, mm -hmm. And the title is uh, Death, Where Will We Go? Truth is a brooding fire, delicate as twilight, day and night fold gently into one another, share dream terrain, cosmos, mischief, and memory. Tree limb highways synapse the brain of sky, map squirrel navigation, rest stop bird migration. My call becomes a whispered secret, a photograph silent in time. Thank you. Um, I see Pam Baggett has joined us. I skipped over her. I wasn't sure she was going to join us. Pam, do you, would you like to try to read? I have internet. Let's try it. Um, 
Don't. And I will hang curtains when I'm getting ready to teach this afternoon. I know it's glary in here. Actually, I'll hang blankets. I haven't owned curtains. Go for maybe it. Ever. <laughs> I live in the country. Who needs them? Eno River sunset, late November. A red-tailed hawk dives from a pin oak into sun that slants beneath clouds like light under a locked door. The red tail cries, river flashes silver, the whole dark winter waits. Very nice. All right, uh, next, Kat Baudry, then Les Brown and Kenneth Chamley. So Kat, go ahead. Hey everybody, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm from Winston-Salem, and uh, that's where this poem was written. And um, just want to give y'all a warning. It's about a friend of mine who took his life in 2019. This is called Judging Distance. How far is it from here to the topmost power line? Is that how far you fell? Traffic snakes below like water under the gorge. Thank you. Les? Okay, this is um, a poem that reflects back on, my, well, two things. One, my age, I'm old. Uh, the, other, the other is uh, my memory of, of a special little cap that I had when I was a child. It's called Winter of 1951. My brown avi aviator cap was soft leather lined with rabbit fur. It had ear, ear flaps that I lowered when the cold mountain wind cut through the wool toboggans my friends wore. It even had goggles, made me look like a man like my uncles who were flying over Korea. I pretended to fly and wore it until the heat of spring made me raise the flaps until the seams wore out before I began to see the real things of war through the scratched lenses. Very nice. Ken Chamley. I'm here. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm in Mills River, North Carolina, which is between Hendersonville and Asheville. Uh, this poem is called Absolute Faith. It's the title poem of a chapbook I published at Byline Press years ago. What was it I was thinking about driving home that night? turning some question like keys in a pocket when a fox arced from a laurel break just as my headlights swept the curve. Spotlighted, exposed, he whip turned his body so his rear paws touched as he jumped back in the woods he leapt from. I think it the most graceful movement I have ever seen, a slip of red smoke touching a breeze such a moment terrifies the ease in changing direction, wholly committed and then undoing it with no caprice, just absolute fate in opposites, seconds apart. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. That's nice, very nice. Um, Sandra Dreas, Grace Ellis, and Michael Gaspany are next, so Sandra. Go ahead. You're muted. You're muted. There we go. Yep. I'm uh, from Winston Salem, and uh, the poem is an elegy. Bad stars. I don't want to think about your brain, but I do. I must. Starfish invade our brackish tide pool. They bear spikes, cells shaped like stars, anaplastic astrocytoma. Surgeon's referral, neuro-oncology, 17th floor. Wrong way, do not enter. But we do, we must. Doctor's voice, inoperable. No shape to a prognosis, 18 months. 
Brain stars, 33 years to lose their genetic way. A soulmate's pilfered prayers, any chance to find Polaris. Thank you. Grace, go ahead. Grace, you're muted. Yeah, I'm, there we go. Um, I, Kathy, I can't believe that I wrote also a poem about a hen in the time of COVID, <clears throat> but it takes a different, um, different turn. My husband has chickens and one of them was broody this time. So I learned about that. The broody hen moves slowly, head hung low. Is she sulking? or looking for a spot where she can build a nest, dreaming of warm eggs beneath her, the sounds of shells cracking and chicks peeping. And as I drag myself through the long days, wasting precious time like Otis Redding, watching the tides roll away, do I have a bad case of the quarantine blues? Or am I waiting for words to germinate and hatch? Thank you. Michael Gaspany. Hi, uh, I'm in Greensboro. Good morning to all uh, and congratulations to all of you. It's a pleasure to hear your poems this morning and to be here. The poem I'm gonna read is very, very short. It's called Fittings, and I have a footnote to it after I finish the poem. Fittings. A homeless man snores against the bridal shop door, like a dog pressed to the seeping heat. The niche, a perfect fit, beyond the threshold, gowns glow, the placard in the window states, by appointment. That's the poem and here's the footnote. The bridal shop has gone out of business. So <clears throat> this scene no longer exists. COVID has taken the bridal shop too. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Um, Let's see, Janice Harrington, Deborah Kaufman, Joan Liotta. Um, Janice, it's all yours. Thanks, Sam. I'm uh, Janice Harrington and I'm in Chapel Hill. And my poem is titled, To Pass the Waiting Hours. All summer, we leaned over puzzles spread across our shaky card table. Afternoons and evenings, we matched pieces notched like tiny continents. As unseen loons called to mates across the lake. And peonies pressed large white faces against the porch screen. And loblolly pines dropped needles silently on the roof and breath by breath, you left me. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Deborah Kaufman. Oh, wow, you guys, you're blowing my mind here. So much sorrow, huh? Um, I'm Deborah Kaufman, I'm in Mebben, and um, I'm honored to be part of this this group of um, poetry in plain sight. Uh, my po poem is titled Cohen. And if you don't know it, a Cohen is a, a paradoxical riddle um, that's used in Zen Buddhism to help provoke enlight enlightenment. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have allergy, so <clears throat> I hope my voice will hold out. Cohen, sift life, I thought she said, just before we hung up, 
we'd been talking about discernment and dying. All week, I considered her words, tried to sieve my worries, wash any nuggets clean, notice how every grain observed might glisten. Next time we talked, I asked what she'd meant. Did I say that? She laughed. I have no idea. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. John, Leota. There we go. Unmuted. Very rare that I'm muted. My family would like to have a button like that for me, I think, sometimes. Um, I'm going to change the mood a little bit uh, to nostalgia. Uh, this poem, Quilt, I actually sent it in on, on a whim. It was uh, as one of the three. Um, <clears throat> to show you how old I am, uh, it won a prize in the 2017 Silver Arts, and I'm well past the early age to enter things in that. Uh, I, I just entered it on a whim too, and uh, it did get a statewide award, but um, I think it's because people love their grandmothers. <laughs> uh, the title of this poem is Quilt. Sitting on my couch, I snuggle under a quilt made from grandma's coats. Each square is cut from a day we went out together to shop, to lunch, or to church. I would lean against her in a car, streetcar, or taxi when I was weary of it all. Grandma hugged me, pulled me close, my cheek against each season's coat comforting me. Now each square is a pathway back to childhood when my cheek on grandma's coat could quiet the discord of a too busy world. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. Thank you, uh, Chan. Calvin Olson, Diana Pinckney, David Poston. You're up, Mr. Olson. Yes, sir. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm Calvin. I live in Chapel Hill. And for the next couple of weeks, we've been here about seven or eight years. And we are leaving the country soon. Uh, this is a very short poem called Translucence. This is not eloquence, it is genius. Genius the way the Romans meant, a spirit that follows you from birth to death. Doing what? I do not know. Light a scented candle this evening. Take off your skin the way you would take off your coat. When you find out what that spirit does, tell me. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Diana? All right. <clears throat> I'm Diana Pinckney in Charlotte. And uh, I'm, I'm going to change um, the gears here, too. This is um, and what they call an ekphrastic poem, which um, that word just drives people nuts. But it means uh, <laughs> right, uh, making art from visual art. And I've been on. Uh, um, a tear with that, with um, Hopper poems that were published in Poetry in Plain Sight a couple of years ago, and now I'm on Picasso. I would like to put the two together for a book, a group of, of Hopper and Picasso because they were so different. But this is titled Picasso's Self-Portrait, 1901. Already blue at 20, and purple coated, he turns a pale face to us. Black eyes burn over sunken cheeks. The nose, classic Roman, a pencil mustache above full lips. Hungry after a freezing Paris winter in a city that had not welcomed the unknown Spanish artist, a young artist starving in all ways, ravenous for the world. Still, severe as he appears, surely 
they were French beauties, unable to resist a look that says, I want. This look from a man who had his first woman at 13, a man who knows any woman, if not already his, soon will be. Hmm. Wow. Well, Rupert? That's me. I'm zooming in from Durham. And the title of my poem is Blackberry. It is the single blackberry, the tang, the sharp, the tart of it, that pricks the palate, punctures the consciousness, and brings us back to the moment, the here, the now of the fruit, the black, purple seed that pops, tingles, explodes, bringing the sweet, sharp heart of the universe to the tip of the tongue. Thank you. Very good. Uh, David Poston. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Greetings from Gastonia. Uh, the poem I'm going to read appeared in the last edition of Iodine Poetry Journal, and uh, we miss it. This is The Garden Takes a Grist. <coughs> the world is sacred. It cannot be improved. Snow is shadow. Ice is light. Breathe, and wildness comes in. Bit by bit, the garden takes over itself. Snow is shadow. Ice is light. The moon not only full, but beautiful. Bit by bit, the garden takes over itself. After we leave it, we dream of falling. The moon not only full, but beautiful, descending and ascending all our lives. After we leave it, we dream of falling. The space within us is not our own. Ascending and descending all our lives, the world is sacred, cannot be improved. The space within us is not our own, breathe, and wildness comes in. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. The next three I have are Kristen Ryberg, Martin Settle, and Sherry Siddle. So, uh, Kristen? Yes, I am so happy to be a part of this. And I have a, I'm, I'm calling from Boone. And um, I have a short poem called, In Our, Our Revivescence. We are incandescent, invisible light, sing strong songs to dance a new world, repurpose green words like fiddlehead ferns, uncoil from unknowable forces, recycle ohm under our masks, reverb the earth as mother, she knows what to cut to sustain. We dig, soak pungent roots, place two drops daily to open the tongue. Beat drums in the streets, march to the rain. Oops, well, <laughs> somebody dropped something. Everybody okay? <laughs> it wasn't here, I don't know. Well, please please try to mute, mute your... Uh, your feed if, uh, if you're not reading. Thank I hope you. my poem didn't do that. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> it has an effect. Um, Sherry, Siddle. Okay. This poem is the first one in my very first chat book, which will be coming out September 10th, called Sweet Land um, with Finishing Line Press. I'm in Chapel Hill, by the way. Let us know the night. At sunset, geese have settled in the field, close by the spring-fed pond, dark water green. Mock orange, newly blown, its white blooms yield, a quiet scent that fills the air, unseen. The dogs smell deer, run barking to the fence, cannot be contained, the weedy roar, bees who rub themselves against the blooms, 
since time is short before the moon decants its pour of milky light, a cataract of sleep that folds all in, suspends the drive to find the perfect food, the perfect love, the deep connection where we leave the past behind. Let us not be lost as dark descends. Let us know the night, its comfort and its end. Very nice. Hey, can I ask a question? Are you proceeding alphabetically? I'm trying to, did I miss you? Yes, you did. I apologize. That's okay. Now, um, tell me your name. It says M.G. Rao. Is that correct? Raphael. Uh, on your list, um, Maria Raphael, R-O-U-P-H-A-I-L. I don't know how this turns out uh, to be. M yeah. I got you. Why don't you go next? Okay. Because I, I actually have to leave. That's, uh, but thanks. So thanks for this. Let me just uh, make my, get my poem. And um, yeah. Okay, this is a this is a, a tiny poem. I, I wrote it for my grandson, and I was in a Franciscan mode at this time. Um, and congratulations to everyone who's getting a book out. I just found out that my manuscript has been accepted for publication too. It's my third book uh, with Finishing Line Press. So congrats to everybody. I buried a little bird today in the backyard behind the old beach. What sort of bird I cannot say, or its age, or where in its body it suffered the fatal flaw. I only held in one hand its beating wings, the closed claw and gaping beak, its shuddering feathered head. And when it stopped, I dug a hole and to the beach I said, be kind, be kind. Thanks. Thank you. Martin Settle. I'm coming from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, my poem, is uh, called Ultrasound. I think uh, it's kind of interesting to me that uh, I suppose you can date people from when they had photo albums to the point they had photo albums with the first picture in it, an ultrasound picture, which was very exciting. And uh, so this poem is for my daughter, Hannah, Ultrasound. We saw you today in the place of mermaids an anemone in a tide pool. We swam above you and below you. Sometimes you hid from us in the kelp and we spoke to you like dolphins, joyful parents without hands. That's Very it. Nice. Thank you. Um, Eric Whale. I'm Eric Weil. I live in Raleigh. Uh, the poem I'm going to read was first published in Ponder Review in 2020. A frayed collar. In the museum of lost household actions, dialing a rotary telephone, ironing sheets, repairing a small appliance with screwdriver and pliers. My mother sits in the heat of an incandescent light bulb turning the collar on one of my father's shirts, carefully ripping and pulling the thread, then sewing it back on, frayed side under, to gain another year before consigning it buttonless to the rag bag, where later my father will grab it for waxing the car. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Richard Allen Taylor there. Why don't you read Richard? Thanks for your leadership, Sam. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Good to see you. I'd like to read a poem um, that first appeared in Iodine Poetry Journal. And David, I miss it too. Um, this is uh, entitled Everything That Was Closed. And it's probably, I think, the only poem I've ever written about conjunctions. Everything that was closed could open again someday. Even the past unfolds to memory or history. Many things can be either. Practically everything swings by the hinge of either or. Either you will or you won't. It is or it isn't. 
It's a question of near or far, coming or going, speaking or remaining silent, standing firm or running away is hardly ever a simple and. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, Charles Wheeler, are you here, sir? I am. Okay, you're up. This is uh, a short poem. Oh, I'm in Winston-Salem. This is a, a short poem entitled Security. A wren wove fescue blades, wheat straw, cat hair, twigs in my mailbox. The postman dutifully forced in a Harris Teeter flyer and an L.L. Bean catalog. Rules are rules. The world so easily unravels. All right. Well, that I'm sure I'm. Well, yeah, I'm sure I've probably missed someone as a, as they've come in. I'm going to go back over the list one time of the people who had said they would read um, that uh, have not read. Uh, Diane D. S. I N D. Sorry, I'm struggling with that name. Is Diane here? Okay. Um, let's see. Pretty good. Lisa Persley? Yes, I'm here, Sam. Okay. Please, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm Lisa Persley. I live in Swansboro, North Carolina on the coast. And the poem I have today is Taproot Skills. Like pines in a forest, we don't stand out until we're damaged sliced to a stump, split by a bolt, twisted in the storm. Then the trail walkers stop to admire each of us for what we've endured. With thoughtful glances, speculate to one another about causes and conditions. When what they really want are the reasons we're still standing to unearth those vulnerable taproot skills. Thank you. Very nice. Um, Shelby, you out there somewhere? Stevens? Okay. Uh, Peter Venable? Okay. I think that is everyone. If you are a featured Pips poet and I've missed you, please, please let me know. Okay, that concludes that part of our program. Um, let's see, well, I wanna thank all the poets who have uh, made time to read this morning. I know Saturday mornings are a busy time for everyone. And uh, one last thing, uh, it's just amazing to me the quality of the poetry that came in. I mean, the three judges had a very difficult time. There were a lot of very good poets and poems who did not make the cut. So uh, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, and also uh, you may have noticed in one of my emails that go out and also in the, in the emus and maybe even uh, another outlet that uh, we have, uh, I have 900 posters left over in my basement that I am uh, trying to uh, sell, and I give a lot away. I mean, people send me a check, I'm going to give them some more because they're not doing any good in my basement, and I know you'll do good things with them. But, uh, you know, if you would like to purchase anyone else's form, please refer to that list. And um, if anyone wants extra copies of their poems when they are published, you know, please let me know in advance. I sent the list out the other day. I'm sorry if that was not a good month that uh, you ended up in, you know, I just, but there's only 48 slots. And we did start out with our poet laureate, former poet laureates and current, uh, Jackie, uh, Joe Beth Joseph Bethanti, mm -hmm. um, Shelby, and help me, some, one more. <laughs> Kathy Smith-Bowers. Yes, thank you. 
I've looked at so many Excel spreadsheets with this in the last nine months. I'm a little bit uh, cross-eyed, but thank you so much for uh, participating in the program and also today reading. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Celestine and I think we're going to have an open mic. So if you, if you want to stick around and read another poem, you know, I think that that would be fine, but thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Sam, for heading up tips and also acknowledgement to Kevin from Press 53 for um, creating such beautiful broadsides and fabulous job poets. That was awesome. It was awesome. So we will, I wasn't sure we we're gonna have a time for open mics, but we will seem like we will. And so if you would just like, just sign up, just put your name in the chat box and we will call on you until, you know, <laughs> You get everyone read before at 12 o'clock at 12 we will break for lunch and um so if you want to read just uh, put your name in the uh, chat box and we will, you will get an opportunity to read okay could, could i interrupt sure shelby has come into the chat room oh, uh, great. <laughs> so shelby are you there <laughs> am i here yeah <laughs> i'm there <laughs> um, all these faces can, can you click on your video? Um, there you are. There you are. I've talked time for the time. The host has asked you to start your video. Start my video. You're, you're on. It looks soon, doesn't it? Well, maybe. <laughs> uh, would you like to read your poem to us? Hey, am I... Uh, what am I on? Yes, yes, you're on. I'll be quiet, so I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. The stage is yours. Oh, you want me to read a poem? The the featured Pips poem, if if you have it available. Yes. Pips, Pips is a funny word. It's um, <laughs> it's not a palindrome. Um. Okay, this is this is called. Uh, it's from an unpublished manuscript named uh, "Childhood." If any of you know how to get published, let me know. Where time stood still for Nin. Quick story behind the poem. Uh, we went to. Uh, I grew up on what was called hillbilly music in the Renfro Valley out in. Uh, old time music in Kentucky um, and that's that's where that's where this poem is set once we visited Renfro Valley saw the big show barn and the spores around the red bud log schoolhouse it was a gathering the stars hung out with his hidden dell in Hurricane Hollow. I don't know how to say it. Time stood still. Memory furnished a cave with love we take to heart. Without Thank you. Thank you, you know, It's good to be here, and Sam, for you to do this and uh, and all of you, um, um, it'll help us get through COVID. Thank you, Sam. Well, I think one person had mentioned, um, you know, the poems were so sad. I think it was Deborah, and uh, I think it was just a reflection of the times. I mean, 2020 was a, was excuse me a bitch. I mean, we just one in one respect to the other, you know. And I think we got through it, you know. And uh, but we did Are you still poetry reflected what we uh, what we were feeling at the time. Okay, well, I think uh, Celestine, are you going to handle the uh, open mic? Absolutely. All right. Well, so okay. if have, if it's still time to and as we go. If you still want to sign in, we'll be uh, you know going on for till twelve. So um, to, until you have something you want to say, Linda. No. Okay. No. All right. Let me see. Let's see who's in the chat room here. 
and I'll just jump in. Bill had a great um, question. Uh, Sam, can we see a sample of the broadsides? Can you lift one up? Oh, that would be great. Thank you. Unmute. Sam, you're muted still. Here we are. This, you know, um, you can see the, the sponsors along here. There's Press 53, as I mentioned earlier. They've been there since the get go. And um, right, Winston Salem Writers, uh, the new posters will be Winston Salem Writers, Press 53. The, and the network, and of course, Poetry Society. They're the, they're the big, uh, they'll be on every, their logos will be on every poster. Sam, of the 900 you have in your basement, are mm -hmm. they all of one broadside or are they oh, many no. different um, poems? There's, there's about a hundred and, I think I started out when I did the inventory of 1,052 poems, that uh, there's about 140 different poets represented and that list is out there somewhere. Linda was great about getting that onto the uh, the emus, and uh, it's not current. You know, I need to get with Paul and figure out how to make one of those little things that I can constantly update. But um, it it's it would uh, it'd be good to check that source and you know email me if you if you have a have a question and I'll I'll fall back and you know try to find some that uh, you know you like. I like that very much. Thank you. It's 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 ten dollars, and the and the real uh, the real expense is the mailing of uh, the postage. Uh, but at ten dollars, you can buy two poems, and they're a dollar a poem up to eight, because then the postage changes. And um, um, I usually, you know, as I say, kick in a few, you know, extras to sweeten the deal. So uh, if you have have some. Uh, favorite poets I'll I'll work with any way I can. Okay. I'm gonna give the list as I have it right now. Uh, and I'm still adding to it. Um the, the first uh three is gonna be Kat Baudry, Janet Ford, and Laura Younger, and then Regina Garcia. And I'll be working on the list after then I'll make the next announcement of who's gonna read. All right, thanks, Celestine. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a poem, another, <laughs> this is another one about the pandemic, sorry guys. Um, but it's called Uncertain Times and it begins with a quote. To some degree, life will be uncertain no matter what we do, Mick Scott. How do you know you won't die tomorrow? In the sunshine, driving to the library, retro sunglasses framing your oval face, burgundy pants you bought online and sent back until you found the right size. It's the perfect disguise, an ugly moment posing with the right filter. I take issue with uncertain. We still walk and talk and love and make jewelry the measuring cup scoops out the right amount of crunchy cat food twice a day. How can I not create some amount of certainty for those I love? My high school reunion will be canceled after I missed the first one and found out all my bullies weren't there. Maybe I'll never see my friends in person again. Maybe I don't need them. They say chaos breeds creativity, but this is normal. Fear events are the state of the planet. We should start a newspaper and call it Uncertain Times. In small print on page one, section B, some UN advisor says we are living in the shadow of nuclear war. It is always a shadow, bending over our shoulders, reaching for the times. Wouldn't it be ironic if one day it strangled us? We never saw it coming. In December, before the pandemic, the big wigs decided to trim the fat. Extraneous editors whose work would siphon to others. It was an unprecedented event, and I sobbed in front of the HR lady who said I could take action if I felt it unfair, since I was coming to the office to turn in medical paperwork for a stand-up desk that would help my IBS. 
I packed a box with all my unseen illnesses and didn't look back. Interviewer, what is it like living in today's uncertain times? The cat does not respond, continues licking her belly like a furry seal on the verge of sluggish extinction. Thanks, y'all. Okay. Next person is uh, Janet. You can just speak whenever it is Janet and Laura and then Regina. Is Janet ready? If not Laura Younger, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Okay, great. Um, this is a short poem I wrote recently about a memory. It's called For Wesley. I was the girl on the playground who spun you round, lifted you from the ground, your arms gripped in my hands until released you rose aloft. And for a moment, your heart lifted ecstatic like the top of the swing. Airborne and free you flew, a weightless bird before the ground rose up to meet you. Thanks. Great. Next we have um, Regina. Regina Garcia. Hello, everyone. I'm excited Hello. to be here. My first time. Um, the poem um, that I'm going to um, share with you today is actually an homage to my, to my, my children, my sons. I have three sons. Um, and it's entitled, um, Mothers and Mountains. I have birthed mountains that tower beyond the highest peaks formed within me, stretched in front of me, now steadily trying to overgrow my reach. I have birthed mountains, and I ask that though they not stay, that their chosen way move them higher, Closer, clearly, not over, but nearly to the places that bless them the most. Surrounded by hosts that usher them into the presence of the primer and polisher of perfection, the umbler of their boast. Oh, I have birthed strong mountains. Their very best striations not made by me, but layered with stones of purpose and gifting by hands I could not see my eyes coated by the clay film marking my own humanity. Yet yes, I am blessed to bring forth a semblance of divinity, velveted, framed. Indeed, I have been ordained to love another Trinity that adds to the harmony in lives, lives and lands, maybe not yet seen nor conceived, not even by me. I have birthed mountains, Tripled peaks of promise so intriguing that I can barely entertain the meaning of how and why they burst into my life and turn my heart over and over and over. I can hardly contain the confining love that roars to keep them in my grasp. Alas, assignments shift and change and pass. Mountains. I've been the vessel and the maiden who poured she who yet adores, they who point and stretch toward the sky and drinking back the selfish cry, she, me, continues to try to remember that although their ascent is their own, her prayers rendered will never leave them alone. I have birthed mountains, mighty, mighty mountains. Thank you. That was wonderful. That's a great. That's a great way to start an open mic. <laughs> now we have <laughs> we have a uh, Joan iPad Joan. That's all I saw. Joan iPad, and then we'll have Melinda, and then we have Kristen, and then we have Joanne Hoffman. Thanks, Celestine. Um, you know, I forgot to tell you all when I read before that I'm from Calabash. Uh, I'm way down here at the far southeast corner of the state. So I really appreciate being able to come by Zoom. Uh, Zoom has opened up a lot of meetings for me that I would have had to have driven four hours sometimes and stayed overnight 
to attend. And this makes it a lot easier for me and no parking worries either. So <laughs> uh, during the pandemic, uh, one of the things I uh, was uh, nature, even though this poem was written the year before the pandemic, I was actually a little bit confined to the home in 2019 uh, because my husband wasn't feeling well. So we didn't travel a lot. And I took a lot more walks uh, when pollen allowed. So I'm reading to you this poem called Ruffled. Ambling about in mid-morn's quiet between two rows of loblolly pine, my meandering reverie is broken by a flash of feather, white, black, capped with crimson. He darts by closely, my cheeks warmed by his passing wing. Now, roused from reverie, my eye follows his flight. Only his red feathers show, tat, tat, tat. He's at work finding brunch in the bark. I return to my well-worn path, refreshed, invigorated by the flash of woodpecker's beauty, grateful for a moment of being ruffled, a close connection with another. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Celestine, can I interrupt for, yes. for a moment? I've got sure. another uh, uh, Pip's, Pip's poet who is, has joined us. Uh, Diane, would you like to go ahead? <laughs> Diane? Yes. Oh, yes, I'm here. Yes, uh, you're, we don't see your, your face. But, uh, Let me see. Where Maybe I need to put on... Uh... Share screen? No, I don't say, know. Say uh, just maybe your video. Just mute. And mute uh. Okay. Okay. I'll just start, read my poem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. It's pretty short. All right. It's called uh, Magnolia. And here goes. After rain, I step around trend, translucent puddles as if crossing a stream on stepping stones. The fragrance of sweet blossoms lures, lures me towards its source. Spread within my grasp, dark, low-slung branches beckon. A voluptuous milky white flower, the size of a saucer, delicate as bone china, nestles within a glistening leaf bed. Perfect mantle adornment. The magnolia's velvety petals frame golden center threads brimming, brimming with nectar. Intoxica intoxicated by the aroma, I clutch a higher bough to reach for more. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I'm glad you, glad you got, got with us. Yes. You can stick, I, you can stick around I, for the open mic if you like. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks for letting me read. I'm going to see if I can click on my name or something, get my picture up. I don't know. Not that I am. All right. Sorry. And nothing nothing to happen. Yes. We'll get yes, back okay. to this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing everybody. Okay. This is wonderful. So now we again start with Melinda and then Kirsten and then Joanne Hoffman. Okay, thank you, Celestine. Thank you. It's so nice to hear everybody this morning. This poem is called Threading Needles with Camels. It's after, um, it's after the proverb from Matthew called, where it says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Threading Needles with Camels. My husband wears jeweler's glasses to thread needles as he patches clothes. When I see him sewing, I think of camels. If I took hairs from a shorn camel, is that how I get camels through needles? If I held an entire camel with some pulley system and heaved it 600 plus pounds upward, turning it to fit through a two-story opening in a needle, welded from steel, would St. Peter throw open heaven for us all? One strand of camel's hair carries its DNA, but leaves its weight, speed, and height behind. If I moistened a lock of camel hair with my saliva, twisted it, and thread the needle, would we both go to heaven? 
If I pulled out of myself one bit of inner camel, the part that lopes through the desert, shuttling tourists without bitching, would I be more decent? Sometimes I overthink proverbs, but I love camels, for they just chew, spit, and bat heaven around. That was wonderful, okay? You can just go ahead and read uh, okay. Kristen and then Joanne. Sure, I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, wow, Melinda, I love that poem. That was great, <laughs> the camels. Uh, so I've started shuffling through all my folders. This one comes out of the um, political heading. It's a pantoum, and I always feel like I'm cheating a bit with pantoums, but this is called Tired, a pantoum. Tired of breaking news, of broken limbs, fallen on forest floor, resigned to the return, of broken limbs to be reset, lined up, resigned, to the return of repaired wholeness, to be reset, lined up, enough to support fever dreams of repaired wholeness where everything became wise, enough to support fever dreams of good hearts wild acts where everything became wise, tired of breaking news. Thank you. <laughs> Joanne? Joanne Hoffman? Yeah, I'm here. I was okay. looking for my mute. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. This, this is a lot of fun. Thank you for organizing this. And Sam, in honor of um, the PIPS program, I am pulling a poem I had in the PIPS program in 2018 called When Rain Was My Teacher. I learned that gray is a lovely color, that silver has a sound, that drumming is a drug, that sky fallen water is an equalizer. It doesn't prefer your ground to mine, that raindrops caress or sting. It depends on how you face the wind, that storms invite silence that awareness arrives in a flash and disappears inside the light, that water cleanses a wound but doesn't wash it away, that there is space between raindrops where kindness lives and lovers love, that yes, God weeps, and that poems born in thunder need rain to set their roots. Thank you, everyone. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Our next quartet is going to be Joan Barasowska, Cal, Aris, and Deborah. So whenever it's your turn and when the next person reads, just unmute and read your poem. Okay, thank you. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Joan Barasowska. And this poem is from a new manuscript that I have in the hopper. One plus one doesn't equal two. I've nursed, rocked, patted the baby to sleep. I'm bathing four-year-old Claire who repeats, why can't you just put him back in your belly? Dear, sweet, stupid little Johnny. Hoping to put this refrain to bed, I try a new tack sitting back on my heels on the blue bath mat. When you were in my belly, I wanted so much for you to be a girl. I was very happy when the doctor said to daddy and me, it's a girl. Claire takes a beat, says, maybe you think like I do, that girls are a little bit better than boys. With this temporary truce, we proceed. Thank you. OK, 
Cal, you're muted still. We go. I'm unmuted in Raleigh. <laughs> I'm Cal Nord, and I'm reading a poem called Stop Time. And uh, I have to find it first. Wonderful. I don't know why this always happens to me. Here it is. Okay. Um, stop time. In jazz, it's when a chord is played only on the first beat. By the way, this was in Visions International uh, print magazine. And um, it was published about a year ago. To freeze time, a sculpture in a courtyard, a flower pressed in a book, a butterfly flattened behind glass. Why can't we see things without stopping them? Like particles we can't throw light on without changing by a photon's reflection. Do we make them physical when we stop addressing them as points in a flow? Missing certain coordinates, the folded in dimensions? We press things flat to understand the smallest bits allowed in our philosophy or science. We call them probabilities, not even a thing we can hold. Words of ink on a page, old photos, eternal is a dead end. Life moves, sparkles in another's eyes, an instant shared sense of what is, wind on a leaf, Rain on hot tar, touch of a hand, then let go. Thank you. Okay, Iris is next. Hi, yes. <clears throat> Can you see me and hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm Iris Llewellyn Angle, and the poem I'm going to read is from my new po book of poetry that I introduced last week. It's called Walk to Yesterday, A Memoir in Poems. And the poem that I'm reading is called I Am She, and it's after Sandra Cisnernos. I am she of your note, loud, childlike, laughter, giggling, tickling till it hurts. Cries of sly hyenas in dark caves, black night. The strength, the song that's me. I'm Monday morning, snoring like a pig with my bare butt up in the air, dreaming of singing all that jazz in King of the Jungle. Wishing it would never end. I am your now, being, dreaming, trying to fit into that red dress, brown brain left behind with nothing more to say. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, is that me? I thought there was another Deborah. Is this, is, so. I think it was, uh, it was Deborah. Um, I don't think it was you. Um, let me see if I can see, find the name again. But go ahead, and I don't see another Deborah in here. Maybe she had to leave, but hopefully she will be back because I don't see her right now. I know I signed up, but I thought that, you know, just want to make sure. Oh, go ahead. It might have been you, Greg. Go ahead, Deborah, because I don't see another Deborah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm from Jacksonville, North Carolina, not Florida, because <laughs> I always get that question. Anyway, this is a very short poem, so listen for it. It was published in 
road not taken last fall? When Ulster is so far away, never thought they'd miss the burns and hedges that edged the cross, the gorse over a dozen different kinds of heather. Never thought they'd be walking city streets, missing the peat smoke leaking from the chimneys as light as a lark's feather. Never thought they'd miss the lark, the lapwing, wagtail and wren. Never thought they'd miss the mist and all that rainy weather. Never thought how bitterly they'd feel this way forever. Thank you. Our next quartet, this is getting good. It's been good all day. Jonathan, Sandra, Karen with the C, and David. I'm happy to uh, start this quartet and this has been quite enjoyable. My poem is called, If Only. If only there was a door, he didn't remember pulling it open. If there was a window, he couldn't recall hearing the truck outside. If there was a wall, he didn't remember brakes slamming against it. If there was a victim, he couldn't recall thinking she might die. If here was her city, he should have pleaded for someone to help. If here was her sidewalk in his lap, he should have cradled her bloodied head. If here was her block, he should have screamed up at her neighbors. If here was her dog, the truck should not have swerved into her instead. If here was his door, he should have carried her upstairs. If here was his window, he should have covered the light from the street. If here was his room, he would have draped black the walls and ceiling. If here was his bed, he would have laid her wrapped in a sheet. If there was a kitchen, he would have boiled water to wash her. If there was a bed, he would have undressed her to lie there that night. If there was a sink, he would have scrubbed the blood from his fingers. If there was a switch, he would have turned off the apartment lights. If only no door, he never would have left his building. If only no window, he never would have spotted her from the fire escape stairs. If only no street, he never would have knelt down beside her. If only no sunrise, he never would have witnessed her clutch the night air. Yet only for the sunrise, she watched his brilliant wings enfold her in prayer. Thank you. Sandra? There we are. Um, <clears throat> this is dedicated to the Jack Russell Terrier who is right now lying at my feet, my sweet doggy bear. Dog of hearts. To those who say he's just a pet, I cock my head and bark away nonsense. Only a ruptured appendix can wrench me from this pawed perilous couch where my terrier lies, head on my belly, my weighted blanket, bare. He adjusts his rump, settles like a quiche. I dare not jiggle at a delicate juncture. Almost a senior, his shorty coat has grown curly, his lightning pace delayed thunder, fewer solo escapades, rare forays to the creek edged with poison ivy, mostly walks, reasonable duration, those coal-lined eyes approve. They direct my actions, treat, dog bark, mutual unspoken, unwoofed adorations, he shadows when panic overtakes me. Together, we hunt for my phone, misplaced glasses. Wonderland's Cheshire dog smiling. To those who say he's just a pet, I cock my head and bark away nonsense. He will defy the dragons I can't foresee. Lead me over icy mountain passes. I will muscle him aloft 
in shark infested seas, whisk from owls, hawks, wild beasts, my weighted blanket, bear. Thank you. Okay, Karen, you're up. I'm up. So this is some fresh, fresh ink. I don't know why I keep doing this when we have these poetry society gatherings. We love your fresh. <laughs> it hatched this morning. Looking up to two hawks, elevating dawn, narrating paralleling flights through soaring pines, through boundless heights of steely sky, unyielding certainty. What would it be to be so sure of wing of anything? Fresh ink. The last in this quartet is David. Yes, thank you. This poem is called Literally. Um, in the Devil's Dictionary, Ambrose Bierce defines the adjective literally as meaning figuratively, as in the pond was literally full of fish, the ground was literally alive with snakes. Here's literally. When an ESL student came up after class to ask where the sticks were, who lived in them, why, what I remember is the split second before I answered. Arriving at the edge of a pine forest with a wall of trunks spaced as perfectly as pickets and hearing beyond them a murmur of voices that I could almost understand. Thank you. All right, that, this is so good. This is so good to me today. I'm telling you, everyone is to have such, such uh, different various types, you know? I love it. So we're gonna have our next and the final quartet, unless there's someone else goes afterwards, let me know if I think we have a little time, is Kathy, Sam, Bill, and Kabate. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. C-A-B-B-A-T-E, that was what came up. So, so then it's, it's Chris. That's oh, Chris, the, uh, that's, that's what I was saying. I was saying, I, I, okay, I got that. Chris. <laughs> All right, so you'll be number four after, the, uh, after Bill. I'm, I'm Kathy in Burnsville, home of the Carolina Mountains Literary Festival in September. And, and we're going to be going virtual this year. So I hope all of you can attend. Okay. Daily arrangements, salad fork, dinner fork, plate, knife, teaspoon. Mother's daily silver arrangement mannered as her words, each evening the same conversation school, my father's factory, her housebound day, nothing unexpected, eat precisely at six. When my turn rotates to set the table, I am tempted to turn the knife blade out, put the forks in opposite order. If I don't want dessert, should the teaspoon still be placed? Though I'd never give up that sweetness, looking for something to please my tongue, which conforms to the conversation yet yearns to remove the bitterness, to come forth with my questions, which do not fit the family pattern. Everything in order, same seats every night. I face the window, see robins fly, rabbits hop, wind blow the leaves of our oak. I want our table to be as lively. Utensils clink, moderated voices speak of nothing and the same thing every dinner. Iceberg salad, meat, starch, vegetables. As the bowls and platters pass, I make my own arrangement, sculpting colors, textures, landscapes, absent from our talk. All right, I think I was up next. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is my, my, one of my poems about uh, COVID-19 different slant on it though it's a COVID mine's turning into a COVID 25 I think um, it, uh, the title of it is body neutral it was just picked up by National Magazine which I was 
surprised at. Body neutral. So much to ponder relating to ruin. In sweatpants, I sit alone in the kitchen. Shelves full of bowls like islands floating on a dormant sea. Recipe box closed, but healthy appetites insist on skinny seats at the table of debate to, do, to debate dessert. In striped apron vestment, by habit, I complain about myself, even without public shaming. I stretch tall in the window, salivate beneath a supersized moon. Temptations overwhelm with insinuations and proverbs a la mode. This is my body, a still life. Pliable rules provoke me, either with lean divinity or reflexive voodoo. Restraints plate always wiser than piety's platter. I want these uneasy partnerships to reconcile. Jekyll to Hyde, Dante to Bronte, alter egos shedding sandals and tight togas. My body, the podgy regent, after a feast of regret, I cannot resist. Find room to commune at my caramelized hunger, consuming me as I partake pastries among amens. And Hi, I'm Bill Griffin, coming to you from Elkin, North Carolina. Um, this poem is Conversation at the Prescribed Distance. Perhaps you can see that the first and second part of each line are each six feet apart. Conversation at the Prescribed Distance. Between us, dog on leash and air enough to make space enough measured and unmeasurable until we look up and trace the blue curve that cradles us all. So thin a line between this morning and nothing. Between us, the exhalation of this gray beard sycamore leaning out over Dutchman Creek and our breath that so willingly draws into itself. Who cares about droplets and particles? How long since we too last walked moss stones three strides between us, spotting old landmarks, planting new ones, what the weather carries away and what it leaves, what the years carry, no matter the weight. We laugh for a minute about our crazy yard sign neighbor, always punching, always angry. What is he so afraid of until all that fear turned inside out stops our voices asking ourselves, can something so darken a heart that it may give up even caring about caring? You and I, unspoken, those years of darkness between us, speaking now, peeling apart that old anger, its separate parts, the way it separates. We peer into it and watch it lift its heavy branches, shake itself loose, Maybe we are only here this morning because there are years between us and around us and not all that many left ahead of us. Today, may we discover a little more and tell it and we too become a little less afraid. Thank you. Chris, you're next. Okay, I'm still in Holly Springs. And um, this poem is about how thunder sounds a lot like bowling. And um, I mentioned duck pin bowling in this poem. And I don't know if you're all familiar with duck pin bowling, but um, it's Bowling, usually it's, it's confined to the to Atlantic Northeast states, mid-Atlantic Northeast states. And it's a small, like a five pound ball. And you get three rolls per frame and it's great. And I wish we had it in North Carolina, but we don't. So this is called God Bowling. When the thunderclap was a cosmic crash, 
when it shook the foundation of the house until the vibration rippled upstairs to the room my brother and I shared. We called it a strike. And when it sounded like a train that had passed, a rumbling in the distance, the sky merely clearing its throat, we admitted that even God sometimes threw a gutter ball. The only picture of my grandfather I remember is him in a suit and tie holding a bowling ball to his heart, eyeing pins at the end of a lane. His obituary from 1959 read, Giuseppe Stefano, expert duck pin bowler. Not what my mother had told me about him. Farmer, immigrant, factory worker, gardener, but rather what I imagined him to be, herder of storm clouds, gatherer of sky, hands that make thunder. Thanks. That was wonderful, wow. Okay. So I've gone through everyone that has signed it up, has signed up. Does anyone else want to read? Okay, you do. Uh, 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 uh. Yes, please. Andy, okay. better than me. Okay. You may start. Introduce yourself, because we can't see you, Andrew. Oh, there you are. <laughs> oh, so tag my turn? Tag your turn. Good morning. My name is Andy Weatherly. I live in Asheville, North Carolina. My poem is called The Caryatids. <clears throat> An extreme cultural expression, women holding up the roof, chained in place by lintels and cornices, women held down by weight of sky, some strident, claiming their places in the world, fist firm, head lifted, others shouldering weight like 10,000 water jars carried to supply their homes, fields, families with the essence of life. Other statuesque women near falling, crumbling under mass of expectation, weighing down futures, knowing stiff upper backs cannot carry original sin with pride, but with guilt, sorrow, rebellion. Shouldering first woman's guilt, absolving her, just as women share stories, griefs, burdens, helping each other. Weave cloth to decorate and cover, folds and curves of marble, woven by their mothers bearing the weight. What do we expect of these women who hold up the halls of the gods? Are they to welcome strangers with stiff digits and open staring pupils? Are these caryatids who hold up the sky expressions of our true hopes and aspirations of women holding up the sky like grandmothers did so we can play safely, play within their safety under their care? Thank you. So Runa will be going next. Are you ready, Runa? Yes, thank you, Celestine, and hi, everyone. The name of my poem is Nocturne, A Rattling Dream. Shattering thunder cracks under dark clouds of gloom. A tarantula, you drop from the rotting roof and gingerly crawl off my head creep down my neck, onto my chest, tickling the chambers of my heart while sucking my blood, making shreds of my wanting spirit. Your lethal sting brings an end to my tranquil being. I scoff the electric chair. My head droops, nerves gnaw in grief, Bags sag under my tearful eyes. Then I read Rumi's poem, 
The wound is the place where the light enters you. And like a slithering salamander, salamander, the poet's whimsy climbs into my mind, kisses the crevices of my core. Sweet breeze sings in my ears. Droplets of honey touch my tongue. My fingers begin to wiggle. I wake up and feel like a freed paper kite snaking through the sky. My pink and orange ribbons shaking and slicing the air as I fly. Thank you. I think we've, I think everyone has read what I propose we have like 30, we have about 20 minutes before lunch. I hate to call lunch too soon for those who still want to read. Um, so, Kevin, do you have something you need to share with us? Are you coming up on the screen? Is that for me? Yes, Kevin, yes. What was the question? I said, do you have something you want to share? I said you kept coming on the screen. I thought maybe that was a sign. No, no, I, my battery was done. I had to, to shut down and come in the house and replug in. Replug in. Okay, that was that, that was not a sign from the gods. Okay, all right. Yes, okay. So what I usually do when I do um do little writing um meetings, a lot of times I give prompts. And so this is you can do this if you like and share if you like. But I like to do something because we have this whole this thing about you know COVID dreams, but you can't get around because it's kind of prevailing in all our lives right now. And so um, I would like to just what your idea on like the, the prompt of post COVID dreams for 2021. It can be like a couple of lines or whatever. What are your post COVID dreams for 2021? And and we can do that for about five minutes and then just come back and then we'll break for lunch. And now what I'll do is I'll read them as one poem. So if you just write your lines in the chat, I'll kind of read them as one poem. Or I'll let someone else, better yet, let someone else read it as one poem. I think I would elect, uh, I will volunteer someone to, if they would please do it. I think I would try to elect, if he'll let me, uh, Paul. But, but if not, I'll do it. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me to do. Well, everyone is going to write a couple lines based on the prompt of post COVID dreams, 2021. Okay. I've got and that. So, yeah, so you're going to read when they post them and, and we'll come back in about five minutes or so. Then I want you to read it the whole line as, as one point. Okay, I can do this. Okay, great, thank you.
wait a couple more. We'll wait a couple more minutes. I think almost everyone has written something. We'll wait a couple more minutes, Paul. And you can start whenever you want. Okay, here we go without crediting any of the writers and trying not to repeat the people who posted more than once of the same or similar things. My mother takes off her mask to blow out 93 candles. Next week, I'll remove mine. Memorize the color of everyone's eyes, smiling into the future. This poem can only dream of lines to come. For textile and poetic destinations of my heart to recover from COVID-19 beyond wildest expectations, living with abandon, to unmask my inner camel, dance on the deck of a ship sailing for Spain, celebrate all the missed birthdays. I dream of hugging and holding my friends again and seeing their smiles not hidden behind mask, dancing with strangers. I'm dreaming of not falling back into the complacency of believing that life will remain the same. I'm dreaming of holding on to unexplainable creativity developed during the time in which the world attempted to swallow us whole. Having discarded so much rhyme, time, and the ability to touch, it's unwilling to rush. Leap, lift my wings, take flight. Post in the rain, I empty my, my door of closure, tear off the knob, become all window glass windows, receiving sunray casseroles. I dream of driving somewhere for more than an hour and able to use public restrooms. Looking forward to not measuring the distance between us. Seeing my health compromised daughter emerge from her chrysalis of anxiety as a familiar, but changed about to be college graduate. My post COVID American dreams deferred, slept, thrashed sheets of insomnia, awoke with the jab of March rain. Visiting my parents and hugging them while my mom still remembers my name. I dream of going to the ocean, touching the ebbing waves, waiting for the new ones to arrive in a falling gush to touch my feet in the slithering sand. I dream that we learn something that makes us better. I think that's all I've got. Yes. Guys, yeah, Thank guys. You. Thank you so much for that too, Paul. Oh, you you are saving these, aren't you, uh, Malika? You're welcome. Yes, the chat section's available. Okay, well, great. So maybe we can put them together and kind of let somebody manipulate them a little bit and create one long thing. I love that. It's it's been a trying time, but it's been a learning time as well. So I just want to thank you guys so much for sharing and uh, being willing to go with me in this impromptu kind of situation, but we never knew what kind of time we was working with, so we tried to make the best that we could. So we're going to um, make sure that you get pens and pencils and be ready to for this interactive workshop that's going to be put on for, with Pam Baggett. I'm looking forward to it. It's about writing short, powerful poems, which you've got you pips 
writers know all about that. <laughs> so, but the rest of us can, we can all learn. I'm really looking forward to what she's going to be teaching us and showing us. So she can have some sample poems, uh, some poems for us to look at. And I'm going to put those, we're going to put those in the chat so you can look at them as she, so you'll be, they'll be there as she goes over them. So if I'm going to go and get myself something to eat and I'll be back in a few minutes and I'll be hanging out with Karen and whoever else wants to come in. And when we start lunch, it will not be recorded. So anything you need to say, Malika? Nope. See y'all soon. That's fabulous. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. I doing that every day. And I have resumed recording just to let everybody know. One, be be on your best behavior, people. <laughs> Thanks, Malika. <laughs> I have my Kleenex box over here. So I'm watching. Uh, uh, Malika, are you going yet? I'm right here. I'm trying to spotlight her so it won't keep going. Okay, okay. I want to spotlight you see her. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. There you yeah, go. You did it. Go. Fabulous is. job. So we'll just see her while she's doing her thing. But that's and a lot of me, guys. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> are we ready to start, Celestine? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, um, first, let me introduce you. Let me introduce you. Okay. We, this is Pam Baggett. She's the author of Wild Horses from Main Street Rag 2018, a runner up for the Kathy Smith Bowers Chapbook Competition, and she received an honorable mention for the Brockman Camel Award from the North Carolina Poetry Society. Other awards include the Ella Fountain Pratt Emerging Artist Grant from the Durham Arts Council, two artist project grants from the Orange County Arts Commission, and a 2019-20 Fellowship in Literature for the North Carolina Arts Council. Recent poems appear or are forthcoming in Asheville Poetry Review, Cacolac, Poetry in Plain Sight, San Pedro River Review, and Tar River Poetry. Pam lives in Cedar Grove, North Carolina. And so she's going to send us into this wonderful interactive workshop called Earth Lightning Crafting Brief Powerful Poems. And I'll let her tell you more about it now. Thank you, Celestine. Uh, and thanks, Malika, and thanks to the board for making all this possible. This is just amazing that we get to be together. Um, so this workshop idea came from, to me, from Joan Beresofka via, via Sam Barbie, who said he'd love to have more submissions for poetry in plain sight. And their line limit is 14 lines. So that's a pretty short poem. Um, I settled on 16 lines for this workshop. And so we'll be looking at poems of 16 lines or less. Uh, my plan is for us to look real closely at four really phenomenal poems and then we'll take 15 minutes to write and then we'll wrap up with two more poems to give you something to think about as you go out the metaphorical door. Um, so three reminders, your internal editors, those voices that say you're not good enough to do this or you can't say that, uh, these guys are all at a fabulous editors party in Cleveland today. Uh, so let them babble at each other and let's all just be free to be really smart and deeply honest. Second reminder, if you don't write more than four words, call it 15 minutes well spent. I'm terrible about writing to prompts and workshops, but if I let things soak, if I don't let those internal editors beat me up for not being super productive in the moment, I often get a poem three days later or three weeks later, but stuff happens. Um, so be respectful of your process, whatever that is. Uh, American playwright David Rabe said, and this is a guy who wrote whole plays this way, I get a sentence, an idea, an image, and I start. I don't know anything beyond it. I follow it. And third, if you hear me say anything that sounds like a rule about writing, I misspoke. Please don't make me one of your internal editors. Pam says we have to this. Pam says we can't that. I don't want to be that person. As Thomas Edison, inventor of the light bulb, said, there are no rules here. We're trying to create something. Right. Excellent. So the poems we're, we'll examine today are all available online, except for the second very short poem, one by Anya Silver. Celestine is going to put the poems in the chat so you can look at them there if you want to review them when we're ready to write. And Celestine, if you would go ahead and start the screen share.
always that suspenseful moment when you wait to see if Zoom is going to do what you would really like for Zoom to do right now. Right. Oh, hooray. And I'm going to figure out how to get my own self out of the way. There we go. So we're going to begin with the person I consider the master of the short poem, the late magnificent Lucille Clifton who raised six children during the early, early years of her poetry career and often said, why do you think my poems are so short? This poem comes from her book, The Terrible Stories, and can also be found in a collected works entitled Blessing the Boats. Leaving Fox, so many fuckless days and nights only the solitary fox watching my window light barks her compassion. I move away from her eyes, from the pitying brush of her tail to a new place and check for signs. So far, I am the only animal. I will keep the door unlocked until something human comes. And I think we have to have a little laugh here. Spell check does not like the word fuckless. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. Um, I want to just let that poem, just look at it a second and let it soak in. Very short, very short poem, 12 lines. So what do we see in this poem? Desire, loneliness, isolation. She wrote this poem a couple decades ago, at least, but it could be a poem written for our current situation, couldn't it? It's from a series of fox poems, A Dream of Fox, Foxes. So I think it's possible if, you know, she was writing this as a standalone poem, it might have a slightly different title, but, you know, it fits beautifully in that series in her book, The Terrible Stories. And this is the wonderful thing about Lucille Clifton. She is intensely honest. She does not pull her punches. She goes straight for what she wants to tell you, and she's always deeply honest. My, oh, there we go. Screen share is jumping around a little, but okay. Oh, okay, we're good with the poem. There we go. So what we see is right up front, so many fuckless days and nights. This is about desire. And she gives us then the solitary fox watching at her window light who barks her compassion. She gives us a sound image, you know, that using senses other than sight, enriched poems, you've probably heard that and experienced it in your own reading. Um, the more senses we invoke, the deeper our experience becomes. And she moves away, the speaker moves, I move away from her eyes, from the pitying brush of her tail. That adjective is huge here. It's, it, it's doing an awful lot of work to communicate to us. Again, it's a very small poem. And so that word really stands out as having profound meaning. The fox pities her and the speaker feels worth pitying. Um, so many, uh, to, I'm sorry, to a new, I'll, move, I'll move from the pitying brush of her tail to a new place and check for signs. So far, I am the only animal she sees herself as an animal. She's lonely for her kind, this speaker is. And then she gives us this wonderful ending. I will keep the door unlocked until something human comes. She didn't say until someone comes or a human comes or someone human comes. She says something human, an animal, she's in this animal place and she wants another animal and it almost sounds like any other human will do right and we may all know that feeling um, these days we may have that experience ourselves so it's a profoundly good choice she made there that something human comes and note that last word you know comes as in arrives but also comes as in orgasm so she has connected her ending line to her beginning line and taking us right back to the start of her poem. I've been working on a, a longer workshop on titles, beginnings and endings uh, that I'll offer somewhere at some point. And um, so I've really been paying attention to how people 
do that that work and and their poems for instance so she does one of the techniques we use in endings which is to take us back to the beginning and if you were to use this poem today or later as a prompt a model you might consider what animal looks back at you when you eye yourself through the lens of desire loneliness or isolation Celestine, could we have, yes, please, next poem, thank you. This is the poem from Anya Silver from her book, The 93rd Name of God. And for some reason, this screen is doing little underlinings. Please ignore those. There is nothing underlined in any of the poems we're gonna to use today. Um, Anya Silver, everything is perfect. If my cancer recurs, if I vomit from chemo, help me follow the one who knew she was dying, who turned to the man wiping clean her face and said, everything is perfect. Scrape me like a nutmeg, Lord. Release my fragrance. Please just take that in a moment. This poem astonished me when I found it. It's only 45 words, including the title. And it is just, there are no false moves. There are no missteps. It's brilliant from one end to the other. Um, in fact, I would say it's the trifecta, that it wins the triple crown of poetry in that the title, beginning and ending, all are powerful in their, in their service to this poem. So the title draws me in because it sounds happy, optimistic. I want to see this perfection. And then we're immediately slapped with cancer and vomiting. And we're thinking, how is this perfect? How could this possibly be perfect? So she's using her title and first line to create this juxtaposition, this tension and suspense that we have to keep reading in order to see this resolved, in order to understand how we can have those two things in the same story here. Um, there are two ifs in the first line, uh, first stanza, if my cancer returns, if I vomit from chemo. And those are contrasted a few lines later with the woman, the next line, who knew she was dying. So the uncertainty of this is, is present from the beginning. There's also this visceral sensory image of vomiting from chemo. We've all experienced vomiting, if not chemo, but the smell and the taste and the feel of it. So it's um, deeply embedded in the human experience. And she's handed us that. And then notice at the end of the poem, she hands us another fragrance, nutmeg, which is profoundly beautiful smell. So she's got that juxtaposition helping her poem as well. There's this um, stanza about the woman who knew she was dying, who turned to the man wiping clean her face and said, everything is perfect. That sounds like a Buddhist phrase, doesn't it? It's um, yeah. or Buddhist acceptance, I should say. Buddhist acceptance. But then in the next line, scrape me like a nutmeg, Lord. And this sounds like a prayer in extremis by praying to a Christian God. So she's got that juxtaposition too. Um, but look at these last two lines, scrape me like a nutmeg, Lord. She's not asking for this not to hurt. She's asking to be vivid, to really live whatever days she has left, release my fragrance. So we've looked at how the title and the beginning are working in um, suspense with each other. And, but I wanna talk about this last stanza. She says, and said, everything is perfect. And then she makes this leap to a place that she has set up, but you can't possibly see this coming. This is called the intuitive leap where it's consistent. If it's done really beautifully, 
it's I've done really beautifully. It's like watching a figure skater and she's skating along on the ice and gliding and gliding and suddenly hurls herself in the air and does a perfect triple axle and makes a beautiful landing. This is what this poem is like for me. Um, she has leapt to a startling new place, but it's consistent within the poem. Um, and that's a really wonderful way to use the intuitive leap. If you leap to a place that doesn't have something to do with the poem, it's possible, it's possible that might work. There are no rules, but it's possible your poem could also jump off a cliff. And so you really want to pay attention to whether your leap is serving the poem or serving as a distraction at the end of your poem. And I'm just checking my notes. There was one more thing I wanted to say about this poem. No, I think that's it. I think that's it. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant poem. If I could do this in 45 words, I'm hoping to do something this good in 45 words. And yes, as it passes by, you can see this was written in memory of Akiko. Anya Silver died a couple of years ago of metastatic breast cancer that she lived with for many years. And, and um, her book, The 93rd Name of God, talks some about that. And her other book, she has four, but another book, I Watched You Disappear, beautiful tribute poems to women she went through treatment with. So our next poem is by the late Jack Gilbert, another brilliant book, uh, poem, poet. His collected works is possibly, would definitely be in my desert island packet. You know, if I could take five books, I think his would be one of them. This poem is called Michiko Dead. He manages like somebody carrying a box that is too heavy. First with his arms underneath. When their strength gives out, he moves the hands forward, hooking them on the corners, pulling the weight against his chest. He moves his thumbs slightly when the fingers begin to tire, and it makes different muscles take over. Afterward, he carries it on his shoulder until the blood drains out of the arm that is stretched up to steady the box, and the arm goes numb. But now the man can hold underneath again so that he can go on without ever putting the box down. I'll let you take that in a moment. I imagine you've noticed that this entire poem is a metaphor. And we would probably most of us say a metaphor for grief. Um, you may notice how Gilbert stays with his metaphor throughout the poem. He never puts it down, just as the speaker finds ways to go on carrying the box or the grief. And you've probably experienced grief and, and may know that early grief is physical, it's exhausting. And he gives us the labor of that in this poem. Um, you'll notice there are no turns in the poem. There are no attic subjects. We arrive at the ending in a linear fashion. It just stays within the context of the poem. But that's part of what makes the metaphor work is that he doesn't stray from it. He just keeps us entirely focused on it. Metaphor can be a wonderful tool for talking about emotions or abstractions, like, you know, an abstraction like solitude, for instance. So you might use this poem as a model for writing about feelings of happiness or being in love, um, for anger or loneliness or your own grief or solitude or joy or whatever you think of. Um, this would be just find a container Jack Gilbert has found a container for his theme and he uses it straight all the way through the poem. And I noticed that the poem is roughly boxed shaped. If his line lengths were more random, it would lose this effect. But um, I, so I don't know if that was a deliberate choice on his part. It, it actually looks 
like a sort of the shape of a lot of Jack Gilbert poems to me. So he may not have been thinking about that, but it does contribute to the effect, I think, of carrying this box of grief. Since I can't see your faces, I can't tell if I'm moving too quickly. Um, I hope I'm not, but I wanna be sure to uh, get through this and give you time to write. So we'll- Would you doing Pardon? Things? I think you're okay, thank you. Thank you, Celestine. Um, and we can go on to the next poem by Seamus Heaney. You're doing great with that scrolling, Celestine. It's working beautifully. This poem is from his book, The Spirit Level. Postscript. And sometime make the time to drive out west into County Clare along the flaggy shore in September or October when the wind and the light are working off each other so that the ocean on one side is wild with foam and glitter and inland among stones, the surface of a slate gray lake is lit by the earthed lightning of a flock of swans, their feathers roughed and ruffling white on white, their fully grown headstrong looking heads tucked or cresting or busy underwater. Useless to think you'll park and capture it more thoroughly. You are neither here nor there. A hurry through which known and strange things pass as big soft buffetings come at the car sideways and catch the heart off guard and blow it open. We'll just pause a moment here. I keep this poem around. This is one of my all time favorite poems. It fascinates me in so many ways. Um, so what is a postscript? It's an addition to a letter, of course, right? Um, so we're invited in the very beginning of this poem to feel as if we've already read the letter. We're already in conversation with the speaker somehow. And Heaney reinforces that um, by opening with the word and, like you would possibly do, quite likely do in a postscript. Um, I'm sure you could hear as we were reading the beautiful music in this poem, he uses lots of slant rhyme and, and like we have County Clare and Flaggy Shore, September, October, when the wind and light are working off each other you know, he's, he's using his sounds very beautifully. If you are interested in playing more or learning more about sound, going through and underlining the words that sound similar to each other, this would be a great poem to do that with because Heaney is beautif beautifully talented at sound. So if the title and opening line of a poem are the door into the poem, this door is wide open, right? We've already been invited in, we're in intimacy at the very beginning because we're already getting, reading the postscript. And so, and sometime make the time to drive out west. And then Heaney gives us this gorgeous moment in nature and he stays in the moment. He doesn't digress into what this place would look like in December or April. He says sometime in September or October, he's giving us the autumn season. So the wind and the light are working off each other. The ocean on one side is wild with foam and glitter. All these wonderful light and movement things taking place. And it gives us the surface of a slate gray lake. William Wright once said in a workshop that three short words used in succession tend to have a lot of power. And here Heaney does that, but he also gives us um, three long A sounds, slate, gray, lake, which I think makes it even stronger. And he gives us the earth lightning of a flock of swans and the gorgeous description of them. Um, and then he reminds us that we're in the car because you could forget by now. Um, so sometimes you need to reorient your reader and he did a good job of that. Useless to think you'll park and capture it more thoroughly. You are neither here nor there. 
our lives are short. We're postscripts too. He's turning his poem into a, a, a more philosophical place uh, from concrete images of nature into a metaphorical discussion of life. We're postscripts on this planet, a hurry through which known and strange things pass. And he gives us these big soft buffetings that come at the car sideways. Well, at first we probably read that as wind, right? Because he's been talking about um, wind and, um, but then they catch the heart off guard and blow it open. So he shifts again to the metaphorical and he leaves us to fill in uh, what these big soft buffetings are for ourselves. He doesn't tell us what to think there. So by the end of this poem, Heaney has widened the scope of it. He's made meaning of what he's shown us. And you may or may not agree with his meaning, but he's given us his personal truth. I kind of think of this widening out um, approach as sort of a river to the sea approach. You know, if you follow the Cape Fear River in North Carolina down to um, where it meets the Atlantic Ocean, down past Fort Fisher, you know, where I grew up, um, it widens, the river widens in the sea, it blends into the sea, it blends into a more universal place. So often, especially for writing very personal poems, sometimes widening them out into the universal toward the end of the poem can help other people connect with what you're saying, you know, in, in ways that they may not if you stay in the deeply personal. Again, there are no rules here, um, but it's a possibility for an ending is to let your poem widen up into a, a more universal place, more universal theme. So that's four poems very quickly. And I, what I'd like to do now is give you 15 minutes to write and think. And remember, um, we're going to pause and Celestine, if you could put the poems in the chat, that would be great. Um, if you need a reminder, in case you need a reminder about being respectful to your own writing process, whether it's swift as lightning or slow as a turtle, as Julia Cameron, author of The Artist's Way and many other books, films, and plays said, creativity like life itself begins in darkness. We need to acknowledge this. All too often, we think only in terms of light. And then the light bulb went on and I got it. It is true that insights may come to us in flashes. It is true that some of these flashes are blinding. It is, however, also true that such bright ideas are preceded by a gestation period that is interior, murky, and completely necessary. So we'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Just give it a moment and I'll have those in the in the in the um, chat in just a moment.
you should be able to see them there now. And if you have any questions for Pam, please put them in the um, chat box.
you would please find a place to pause and we'll look at a couple more poems. I could see you guys writing. That was really cool. Someone has a question for you as we're sure. waiting for the show to slow down. It says, it's Judith says, everything is perfect, has stanzas. Michiko, dead, doesn't. That's the box shape. Please talk about the choice of small poems. That choice in small poems. Well, I think Jack Gilbert's poem, it was a linear poem. It's, it sticks firmly to one topic. He's not making any turns or changes or shifts in the poem. So it works really well to stay in a single stanza. Um, Everything is Perfect has a lot going on for such a tiny poem. I mean, we have, oops, sorry, I'm trying to put my hands on it. I'm putting my hands on everything but that. I, it's, you know, we have the stanza about um, if her cancer returns. And then we have a separate image of the person who's sick and knows she's dying. And then we have, um, she sets off that phrase, everything is perfect because she really wants us to see that. You know, I, I, that's one reason to make a stanza break. And especially if you use a single line in as a stanza on its own, um, you're really asking people to take that in. So she's asking us to really take in that thought. And then her last stanza is the intuitive leap. And it works beautifully in this poem to also set that off on its own. There might be a reason why you would choose not to, but I think she uh, emphasized, look, there's a way to look at this as perfect, you know, and then she asks her prayer. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, you don't necessarily need stanza breaks, um, but you try and make the best choice for the particular poem you're working on. There, there are no rules about what's gonna be the absolute right thing. But think about what you're saying and how many times you're asking people to, um, ch you're changing a thought and asking people to take that in. Um, those can be good places to make stanza breaks. Now, Bill has a comment. He said, the box shape mirrors the metaphor, the weight and the burden. So the stanza breaks slow us down and make every word and line sink deeper into our awareness. And it's really noticeable in uh, everything is perfect. Yes, yes, I agree. Thanks, Bill. Well, why don't we look at two more poems and then if we have time for more questions, Celestine, you, you'll have to just, just have to let me know. So if you could start the screen share again and we're at uh, Ross Gay's poem, A Small Needful Fact. Let me do that. Okay, there it is. Can you see it? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so if you know Ross Gay's work at all, you may know that he usually writes voluminous poems uh, and often poems that are just bubbling over with happiness. Last uh, spring when um, we all began staying in his book from, I think, 2015, the unabashed catalog of, of gratitudes became really popular and it's because it's so beautiful. Um, I highly recommend it. This poem is not in that book. I couldn't find a reference to it being in a book, but um, oh, I, I do want to say we have a name, the name Eric Garner in the very first line of the poem. And I think t in order for this to make more sense, since you're only going to get to hear this poem read once, I'll just remind you that Eric Garner um, was an African-American man who died in 2014 from being held in a prohibited chokehold by a New York City police officer. Um, and they were attempting to arrest him. They had accused him, the officers had accused him of selling loose cigarettes. <sighs> a small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for, the for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means perhaps 
that with his very large hands, perhaps, in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which, most likely, some of them, in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. It's hard to know how to write about the horrible things happening and that have happened in our country. And one way is to do what Ross Gay has done and what Emily Dickinson recommends, which is to tell it slant, find an angle, don't try to meet it head on if it's too much to take in. Also, I when I look at this poem, I think of Anne Lamott's one inch picture frame. Anne Lamott said, don't try to write about the whole history of women, for instance, but write what fits in a one inch picture frame. So those would be two tools to, tr to use or to think about in terms of this poem and to use in other writing. Um, so we, when you notice perhaps that the title leads directly into the first line, a small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked. It's an interesting technique. Sometimes it's a really great way to start a poem Probably none of us would do the same technique every time for our work, but it's one of the tools in the toolkit and I, I, it has um, a really good effect here. So this back and forth thing that Rob Gay is doing, perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, some of which most likely, some of them in all likelihood, this back and forth is sort of part of Ross Gay's style. He's, he's chatty in his poems, but it also steps up this uncertainty. You know, are the plants living or dead? Some of the plants are alive, possibly while Eric Garner is dead. And it, it resonates, I think the intention here, I, I'm gonna risk, risk guessing that the intention here is to set up the uncertainty of those moments in the chokehold when Eric Garner didn't know if he was going to live or die. Um, he gives us this word gently. He put gently into the earth. Like Clifton's word pitying, this word gently is huge here. It's, in, it's doing important work. So make note of that. Um, and then we talk about, you know, they continue to do what such plants do like house and feed small and necessary creatures. And here I think it's some of the tell it slant. There's some <clears throat> subtle double meaning here because we can imagine that Eric Garner was necessary to someone. Like being pleasant to touch and smell. Well, someone may have found Eric Garner pleasant to touch and smell. Um, likely, in all likelihood, as Ross Gay would say. And then he shifts back to something plants do that people don't, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. That punch to the solar plexus at the last line, you know, for us to breathe. Ross Gay does this so well. He leads us exactly where he wants us in his work, not just in his poem, but in other poems. And then we reach this ending that feels what Eric, uh, Stephen Dunn called surprising and inevitable. Stephen Dunn now said an end, your ending should be surprising and, and inevitable, but there are no rules here. And of course, right? And endings do lots of different things, but this is one of those surprising and inevitable endings. It's just perfect for the poem. I think of this as sort of a funneling effect where the poem starts with Eric Garner, his history as, you know, working for the Hort department and, and um, his putting plants in the earth and we see his hands and we see him working gently. Well, you have to work gently if you're putting plants in the ground. And then it talks about plants and then it just keeps funneling down and down and down to this image of the plants making it easier for us to breathe. Um, if political subjects feel too big and volatile to you like they often do to me. 
remember this poem and think about trying to choose what fits in a one one inch picture frame and then see if there's an an angle you can approach it from that you can tell it slant so that you kind of sneak up on us with what we're trying to say political poems that you know if we're angry if we're enraged and we try to say something head on often what we end up writing are really heartfelt rants and those can be useful but it often it often turns out that it's not so much a poem as it is a tirade and it needs to be used in that way so um we're trying to find an angle when you're um, uh, approaching these hard hard subjects celestine can we have our last poem please so in case you're counting from the moment it hits the screen um this poem is actually 17 lines when you um not 16 like I promised when you uh, put poems in stanzas if you're counting lines for some submission for instance you have to count the blank lines between stanzas as one of the lines I had this in my file for a very long time as a single block of text but then when I was turning this into Celestine and Malika I went to see if I could find a place to an attribution and the poem was published in the journal tone I found it on three sites, including the Poetry Foundation, and it had stanza breaks. So here I cheated, there are no rules. We have 17 lines, but here we go. September tomatoes. The whiskey stink of rot has settled in the garden and a burst of fruit flies rises when I touch the dying tomato plants. Still the claws of tiny yellow blossoms flail in the air as I pull the vines up by the roots and toss them in the compost. It feels cruel. Something in me isn't ready to let go of summer so easily, to destroy what I've carefully cultivated all these months. Those pale flowers might still have time to fruit. <laughs> My great grandmother sang with the girls of her village as they pulled the flax. Songs so old and so tied to the season that the very sound seemed to turn the weather. Just take that in. Karen Borowitz has given us a wonderful poem here and um, <laughs> She starts right away with a smell image, the whiskey stink of rot. I love that she opened strong that way. Um, and in fact, she covers all of the four W's of journalism in the title and first three lines. If you've ever heard of the four W's, they're who, what, when, and where. Of course, poetry often explores why. I mean, we, there's reasons we aren't just journalists, but she gives us all that. So if you're trying to solidly ground your readers, if you're not trying to create mystery or initial confusion for some reason. Um, it can be useful to remember the four W's. So the who, what, when, where. Well, the who is the I, the speaker, the when, when or who, what, tomatoes. In the title, we have the when and the where uh, and the what, September tomatoes. And where is the garden? Sorry, I did those out of order and confused myself. Um, but who, what, when, where. Not every poem needs all of those but if you're writing narrative, often you have those and it's a helpful thing to put them up close to the beginning of the poem so the readers are with you and don't find the information changing later in the poem. Um, I love this second stanza, the claws of tiny yellow blossoms flail in the air. She shows us these plants aliveness you know, the claws are grit, like they're gripping to life and they flail like they don't want to go. So that when she shows us this, then it makes sense when she says it feels cruel to pull them. And then something in me isn't ready to let go of summer so easily. That's a personal truth. It's not hugely profound personal truth, but it is a personal truth here in this poem. Joe Millar said once in a workshop that it works really well to state your truths straight out 
and then put images around them like before and after. And so that's what she's got, the concrete images of pulling these vines by the roots and tossing them on the compost. And then she's got these images of destroying what she's carefully cultivated and the pale flowers that might still have time to fruit. So she gives us her truths straight out there. And then this last stanza, she just takes this poem to a completely different place. Would you call this a river to the sea? Is this a widening out? Yes. Is it an intuitive leap? Yes, because it's not there. So it's a little of both. I mean, endings are not always one exact thing. Um, and there are no rules here. Um, so her turn to this grandmother, who was a great grandmother, I think was a brilliant move. Not everybody's going to relate to putting the garden to bed. So if you stay just with your, the speaker and putting the garden to bed, you need something else to keep people with you maybe. Um, but lots of us have memories of older relatives and we may have memories of their gardens. So in that way, she makes her poem more universal. And she also really, when you think about it, these songs so old and a great grandmother, she's reaching back a couple of generations and then the songs are so old compared to the great grandmother. She actually has linked her garden really to the whole history of human cultivation of plants like for food and flax for fabric and other purposes. So kind of amazing, you know, kind of amazing that she did that. Um, so I'm thinking you might have a poem in you. It's spring, maybe it's spring planting time and you might use this poem as a model for something like that. Uh, but it's poem is also about something you're not ready to let go of, though you sense it's time. So it's possible that's another way you might use this poem as a model for your own work. I need to exit full screen and we're at two o'clock. So we're going to wrap up then and um, thank you. So Celestine, I'm just gonna move on. I assume there are no questions or yes, we're gonna try are. and wrap up. There's, there, there's some in the chat. I just wanted to make sure that I cover over okay. with um, and I wasn't trying to rush you. I thought you were finished with that point. Uh, uh, no, I was like, finished with that point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, someone said, Melinda said, that's a, that's a great title, Small, Needful, Fat. It was a great poem. And, um, and Paul posted a link to the poem, September Potatoes. And make sure you guys just check the chat for some things. Um, there are a lot of thank yous in there. I think that I remember Joan had made a comment, I thought, um, let's see. Um, Raven said that postscript poem sounds like a Ted Kuzer poem. I'm not familiar with Interesting. And Ted Kuzer was former poet laureate of the United States and he is masterful at metaphor. If you wanna practice Ted uh, metaphor and you wanna read brilliant accessible poems get any book of his sounds great um i'm trying to note that um someone had wrote me and someone else uh, i can find my, my my mouse does not want to cooperate it wants to it wants to go back so too quickly but i think um um, Joan, and maybe you can you can just make your comments since I can't find it. <laughs> you were talking about this the, uh, about um, I think about the poem being um, about the single line, something about being a mono something mono stick a mono stick oh, line the other, is the other Joan yeah that's all oh, it was not, yeah I thought it was you. yeah okay. uh, I had a I had a comment that I felt that in this poem she also subtly implies that the human effort has the power to push the seasons forward. In her own picking, she's not ready to let summer go. And then at the end, the songs bring on the change. She's allowing for that to happen. I don't have it in front of me now, so I, I can't tell you exactly how she phrased it in this last poem. But she's. it seems to me that she's implying that the human effort is not at the behest of the season, but that it also brings on the change of seasons. 
I don't, you may not agree. <laughs> so. I think it's fine for us to all have interpretations. Yes, but I, I thought it was yeah. another broadening. That's how I looked at it, that we, you could look yeah. at it that way. Not that it was, she was, she didn't definitely say that. She only implied it as one other, you know, one other way of, of pushing it ahead, so. Yes, songs so old and so tied to the weather that the very sound seemed to turn yes. the seasons. Yes, that's yeah. the line yeah. that I was referring to. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. Yes, you're welcome. I, I, I have yes. a comment. So, if anyone else has a question, please? I do. This is mm -hmm. Regina Garcia. Um, I, I just wanted to comment um, on um, uh, a small needful thing. Um, uh, it, it, which appealed to me for a lot of different reasons. One of which is that I, I write uh, poetry that kind of revolves around social justice and have written some things also about particular situations and people. So um, when I looked at his poem and, and, and I think you, you know, it was interesting that you said he was chatty because I, I agree with you. He, you can tell that probably in his in his interactions with people, I could almost hear his voice and I've never heard him. I, I don't even think I've heard of him, but um, I certainly will be looking at other things that he's written because it, uh, it was, well, one thing that struck me was that in his, um, in his, in his, in his wording, he, he uh, almost sounds like he's trying to um, put people in a place of caring about that because they care about these other things like like we care about uh, uh uh life and plants growing we care about all of these things and and this was a person who was involved in that as well he it it almost he was trying to humanize him um uh, as someone who would do these things and as such yes. you know would be someone that received the uh should have received the treatment that you know anybody else would have received so i i i i, I re that just really struck me when you you kind of you say he's chatty and then that that made him human to me i'm you know and, I, and so i began to hear his voice so I, I thank you for for saying that um and i also feel like i sensed however a little bit of um i don't know if the word is sarcasm he says in all likelihood, I could hear that conversation. I don't know if anybody else could hear that, but I know people that talk like that. You know, it's like, well, so and so, but I don't, you know, I don't know if you see it, but in all likelihood, you know, it, 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 there's some words left out of that. And that refrain is just, I think, very effective, um, especially if you have the, the context for that, if you can, can think about how he sounds in life. Um, but, but thank you, I love the session. Thank you. That was really great too. I think I felt that I felt it was empathetic. He's trying to build empathy, but he's also yeah. challenging the reader right. at the same time, you know, yeah. to, uh, to see things from a different perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this is wonderful. Okay, go ahead, Pam. Celestine, while, while you all were writing, I had a text from one of my internal editors I wanted to tell you guys about. Okay. Um, all our internal editors at that crazy party in Cleveland have fallen in love with each other and they're <laughs> running away to Juneau, Alaska to start a commune, which means we are all free for the rest of our lives to just write. <laughs> Wanted you guys to know that. I also have this quote. I thought it would be nice if we ended with a quote from Lucille Clifton since we began with her wonderful words. Um, before, and she said in one of her poems, sorry, I'm not ending the day, I'm just, summing up my little thing. Yes, Judith. Okay, well, I just, I thought if we could extend the time, uh, one person said he got a poem. Um, I got a poem. Uh, why don't we do some of the poems that people wrote during the 15 minutes? Before we end. Well, I don't want to keep Pam longer than she plans to be here, but I would love to hear them if you, if you know, you want, to, you know, to I'm stay. fine. I want to hear. Okay, well, good. Let's hear them. If sure. someone has something they want to share, we can hear a couple. Yeah. Who said he got a poem that he was working, that he was thinking about for years? Somebody in the chat. That would be me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not a man. Well, then, uh, I think, unless someone else also said that. 
Well, let's if you're willing to share, let's let's see it. Okay. Let's hear it. Can I just sorry, this is Teresa Greco. Can I just interject not to be rude? But for those of us, I think it's wonderful to read and it, but for those of us who have to go, could we just hear Pam's quote? Sure. Um, yeah, sure. Just for those of us who have to exit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, the you, Lucille Clifton, it's very short um, and very beautiful. And it has to do with what I was saying about being free to write, write, write. It, it says, you might as well answer the door, my child. The truth is furiously knocking. That's Lucille Clifton. <laughs> Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, Terry. Thank you so much, everyone who has come. And if you have to leave, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, and uh, thank you for just joining in. I hope you come back. Next meeting is going to be in May, the second Saturday in May, Sam Reagan's Day. A lot of awards going to be given, a lot of great poems going to be read. Yes. So make sure you come back, and we'll be posting about that soon. Thank you all so thank very much. Thank you so much. much. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Thank you all. I have to go too. Thank you. I got. I so enjoyed this. Bye, Pam. May eighth is the actual date that we will meet next. May eighth. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Joan just put it in. It's not like I have that information. You know that, Celestine. <laughs> Bye, Paul. And I'm going to go ahead. Should I keep recording, Celestine, you think? Or you, should I stop it? I think, I think you can stop recording now. OK. Thank you all very much. You're welcome.